Gracias por estar aquí. Es un placer tenerles en el Instituto Cervantes de Manchester, donde un día más vamos a unir la ciencia con el arte y la sociedad. Este es nuestro objetivo. Desde hace más de un año, casi dos años, pusimos ya en marcha el programa España 100% Ciencia para dar a conocer la divulgación científica a través de nuestras actividades culturales. Creemos que el campo científico está todavía por descubrir y la divulgación científica, por tanto, es un objetivo claro de este centro del Instituto Cervantes de Manchester. Y espero que tengamos una tarde llena de, de sabiduría y de divulgación científica. Muchas gracias. My name is uh, Lorenzo Melchor. I am the science coordinator at the Spanish Embassy in London. And today it is my great pleasure to be here to actually officially inaugurate the Fox Ciencia uh, 13 exhibition. Um, this exhibition was meant to be uh, officially inaugurated uh, last uh, 24th of May, but unfortunately, uh, sad events occurred in, in Manchester that uh, led us to cancel that inauguration. Hopefully, we have been able to uh, arrange a series of three different debates about arts, science, and, soci and society uh, in order to retrieve all those speakers that were meant to attend uh, at the official inauguration. The program today here, uh, the, uh, we will have uh, Ms. Quintina Valero and Dr. Ana Vilalta, who uh, will talk about the experience of an artist or of a, a scientific association in that intersection between arts and sciences. Apparently, arts and sciences are two fields that, uh, when you talk to someone, they are fields that very rarely interact. But we will see examples of those, of those interactions and how this uh, intersection is, are, uh, is used as a tool to reach society and to make society get engaged with uh, any, uh, re anything related to arts and sciences. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much to Isidro Cervantes and CERU and Spanish Embassy for inviting me to this event. I think it's really, really interesting, you know, to be part of the science and, and art all together. As Lorenzo was mentioning, I'm a documentary photographer. I'm, uh, I've been working for 10 years. Uh, in mainly like a long-term project stories, but also my background is in uh, economics. So I'm not that far from the science part. And always I've been kind of battling between also my part, like a, the logical part, and, and more like a sensitive part, you know? And um, so basically, um, like Lorenzo was saying, you know, uh, always people think it's really different or, or, or two words, you know, like art and science. And I find myself, uh, while, you know, the way I'm working, uh, I do a lot of research because uh, mainly when I, I'm working in stories that before even I take the camera and start shooting, I tend to uh, read a lot about the subject. I do a lot of interviews. So I do a lot of research in a way so similar, you know, to scientists as well. Um, before I start, you know, uh, taking the camera and go to a place. Also, uh, so I, I mainly have been working between, you know, press photographer, documentary photographer, but also I, uh, one part I was doing since 2008, it was um, uh, the lip designing and delivering a workshop. And for that, uh, I used to teach uh, many times, like a teaching mathematics uh, through photography. So I use uh, uh, photography as a tool. Um, for social uh, insertion, you know, with groups. So I used to, to basically like a basic, you know, mathematics skill in primary schools, in nursery, and also apart from mathematics, also literature. So for me, it was quite interesting and for people because this was a way to introduce uh, some, you know, especially mathematics that we all kind of, since we were little scared of the numbers, so, you know, it's kind of a different language. So it was very successful, you know, this uh, workshop and very interesting. And later, also, I, I did the workshop and, uh, and with uh, different groups in Portsmouth. Uh, for one year, I was uh, working with people with dementia. And so we were kind of exploring different ways 
um, to help the community, and it was uh, like an art and, and, and health project. And so I've been always kind of working, not this kind of pure artistic background, you know, in photography. I've been, uh, maybe because I also studied photojournalism uh, later on, because uh, we are a multidisciplinary art collective, so we are filmmaker, painter, uh, sculptor, people who have installation, me, photojournalist, more like a journalist style. Also, we have a singer. And then we decided to do something unique. It, it was all together working uh, in, about Chernobyl, um, but also the relationship between how radi uh, radiation was affected uh, to the people and environment 30 years later. So we traveled to Ukraine, and then we uh, started uh, doing a lot of uh, research. I interviewed doctors at the National Institute of Research of Cancer in Kiev. And uh, we started meeting liquidators who were the people who were cleaning uh, the, um, the aftermath of the disaster, victims of Chernobyl, and all people basically related to Chernobyl. So, for our, this was kind of my start, you know, with the scientists, you know, uh, connection in a way. So, we uh, met two scientists. This is our uh, first exhibition in Ukraine because also one, what it was very important for this project, we wanted to create a European touring exhibition. So we will travel in Europe for one year, started in Ukraine and then end up in UK, and try to collaborate with the artists in each country where the radiation spread after the accident. So the idea was following the trail of the radiation in Europe and be able to visit all the countries and work with people who, with people who are local, people who were affected directly, and always with the focus on uh, food or the environment. So and, and, and up with a kind of a lot of art and work research, you know, to end up in UK for the 31st anniversary. So this was the logo that we use for the for the um, the touring exhibition in all the countries because we at the end we managed to go to first Ukraine and then we went to Berlin and Spain where we had two exhibitions and UK finally in April just recently. So we interview uh, I interview uh, two scientists, uh, Dr. Martin Hadjut and Nadik Nasikov. Martin, Dr. Martin is from um, Slovakia and Dr. Namik from uh, Ukraine. They both have been working together for 30 years. Uh, what they've been doing is um, basically uh, working with plants and the genetic and see the modification of DNA affected by radiation. And what they were doing, they were planting uh, soybeans, uh, seed and flat seeds, like just exactly in the five kilometers and one kilometers from the nuclear plant. So I don't know you know much about the Chernobyl area, but basically in Chernobyl you have a 30 kilometers exclusion zone where you are allowed to go inside, but you, have, you need a permission, it's all controlled by the government, militaries. So if the 30 kilometers exclusion zone is going to be there forever, because radiation is going to be for two, three hundred thousand years. I mean, never, no one knows really. So basically, these uh, two scientists, they collaborate together. They've been doing that for 30 years, and mainly because uh, also, uh, Dr. Namik, he's based in Ukraine. Dr. Martin is in Slovakia, and they have to use equipment that they, they, were, they did not have this equipment in, in Ukraine to experiment with this one. So basically, the, the conclusion that they were telling us, it was like the, the main conclusion is like plants have survived, and they modify their shapes, they modify their DNA, but they adapt in themselves to the environment. It was difficult to, I wanted to document radiation. I, I didn't know how. I was going there, coming back, and I really was struggling between, you know, how all the information I have and how to show that until I went to this area. And in this area, I found basically this is how it was the radiation. So the, the, what happened, the impact of the Chernobyl accident and the radiation, and also, as a consequence, the poverty generated in the area has created, is, is tremendous. It's one of the poorest places I've never seen in my life. People, uh, children are really sick, 
um, there, there are people, especially uh, villages that are very remote, so they don't have access to doctor or, or proper health care. And um, so basically, I was traveling. I visited about 35 families, and, uh, and I'm visiting the people who are still living in the in the area. They are producing, they are eating there. And what I found through research is that in second generation is where children have more sites of effect, uh, being affected by the radiation, and so. Uh, like my cat, she actually was four years old while it happened the accident. But now that children have problems with her, mainly like a cardiovascular problems, uh, very um, weak uh, immune system, uh, problems in the throat as well. It's not much about the cancer, it's about other, other side effects. And also, what's important is picture because we also, well, as I said, we focus on, on the food. We focus on, on the environment. And what has been, after a lot of research, uh, what has been kind of almost uh, unified by everyone is that radiation, the concentration is uh, bigger and, and higher in the, in the forest, and especially in the mushroom, tomatoes as well. And so we found it really intriguing because, I mean, we were visiting the families and we, were, we had to eat actually as well there, you know, with them. And at the beginning it was very, very difficult because we have to say no, but then when you go there a few times, you know, you just realize that they have a normal life. And, and again, you know, some people are affected by radiation, some people are not. There are people who are in the 30 kilometers exclusion zone, and they, they are okay. They are 85 years old, they are still alive. And there are people who are 70 kilometers away, and they're really sick, or they have um, brain tumors. Well, th uh, good evening and thanks uh, a lot to invite me to this event of Art, Science and Society. I'm coming to talk about the Art and Science as Rook Initiative. I'm, I work, I'm a researcher in the Department of Biochemistry of the University of Cambridge and also director of the Cambridge constituency of the Spanish researchers in the UK. So, in plain words, my research is uh, studying the role of microglia type of cell found in the brain and its relation to neuronal loss in the context of neurodegenerative disease, such as Alzheimer's disease, with the aim to find uh, therapeutic interventions to prevent this loss of neurons. And why that? Because uh, we can think that art and science can be very different and can be considered like alien to each other, but According to Arthur Miller's words, when art and science are merged and they collaborate, revolutionary pieces of work are produced. So the idea of this initiative was the aim to create a space where scientists and artists can work together, communicate, and learn from each other. And in this activity, we aim that the artists will explore the same scientific question or hypothesis, so the, both different ways of approaching to the scientific question will produce different kind of art. Arthur Miller uh, has written a lot of books uh, regarding art and science, and he presented his last book that it's called The Colliding Worlds of Art, Science and Technology, that talks about this third culture that it's called RC, that where art and science dissolve the boundaries and they interact with each other to create a different kind of art. Uh, based in technology and, and scientific knowledge. His uh, physics, he did physics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he's professor emeritus of history and philosophy of science, and he's scientist and writer at many, many newspapers. So after this presentation, we had all the couples who were talking about their work, their artwork. We had at the end eight different proposals, very different from each other. Um, uh, Marina Velez was, uh, was the exhibition curator who was also belonging to the evaluating committee. And the first couple was, uh, the project was, it was a painting that it's called the powerhouse, Mitochondria Dynamics. Kirina Samargitan uh, is the artist and Marta Luna the scientist. And they were, uh, the painting reflects the work of Marta Luna that he works in mitochondrial dysfunction in some diseases. And 
she represented the three layers of, of function of mitochondria. So the second couple was called interwoven uh, and was Diana Scarborough, sorry, and Ana Cabrera. Um, Diana, he's an engineer. He wor is a, wor he, she works with codes and, and different audiovisual material. And Ana Cabrera, she's doing a PhD at the Victoria Albert Museum. I, I haven't said that, but since the proposal selection until the closer event, there were four months where the couples were working together in order to learn from each point of view.